Anita and Prabha, thank you so much for your generous support and underwriting this uh, event here today. And to the organizers of the Chicago Humanities Festival, thank you for inviting me here uh, on, on a beautiful fall day. Uh, I only wish we could be doing this talk outside. Uh, but I will be quick, and then hopefully all of you can enjoy the, the lovely day. Thank you all for, for coming. I want to begin with a confession. I really didn't want to write this book, Little America. When I set out for uh, my first reporting trips to cover this chapter of the Afghan war in early 2009, just a few weeks after President Obama moved in to the White House, I assumed that if there was a book to be written about this part of the war, it would be about how President Obama and his national security team managed to turn around a failing war, managed to reverse years of neglect and strategic drift, how they managed to snatch victory from the proverbial jaws of defeat. You know, I spent two years in Iraq watching the George W. Bush administration try to rebuild that country in the early days when they picked people based more on political fidelity than nation-building expertise. They asked young men and women for their views on subjects such as Roe versus Wade and capital punishment before they were allowed to board the flights to Baghdad. So I assumed with Team Obama in charge, they'd show us what can happen when the pros are put in charge. I wasn't thinking we'd get peace a la Germany or Japan after World War II or the Jeffersonian democracy that the neocons so foolishly thought that they could birth in Iraq. But I was hopeful that the United States and its NATO allies would be able to return Afghanistan to where it was in 2002 and 2003, when the Taliban were on the run and a, a brighter future seemed a certainty. Now, when I was on that first trip in February of 2009, the president decided to dispatch an additional 17,000 troops to the war front. You know, for Obama, Afghanistan had always been the good war, the war that began with two fallen towers and a strike on the Pentagon, not the war that resulted from bogus claims of WMD and faulty intelligence. Back in October 2007, then Illinois Senator Obama had declared Afghanistan the war that has to be won. And if he was elected, he pledged to deploy more troops and uh, make available more financial resources to rebuild the country. Now, Obama's and his advisors assumed that that first tranche of 17,000 troops would be enough to satisfy the Pentagon. And soon after approving those forces, his White House signed off on a strategy document that was designed to guide the use of those forces, as well as those that were already on the ground. And the president made very clear that his goals in Afghanistan and in neighboring Pakistan were going to be narrow and focused to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda in both of those nations. But the plan to achieve that goal was going to be vast, expansive. Instead of focusing simply on killing and capturing top al-Qaeda leaders and top Taliban leaders, the new White House plan envisaged building an Afghan state that will be strong and stable enough to literally resist any al-Qaeda members who might be foolish enough to try to sneak back into Afghanistan from the sanctuaries they were enjoying in Pakistan. And that involved doing what the Americans should have done back in 2001, building an Afghan government, training a new Afghan army, providing essential services to the Afghan people. But with the Taliban in controls, control of vast swaths of the country, pulling all of that off in 2009 wasn't going to be nearly as easy as it could have been had we not taken our eye off the ball in 2002 to prepare for an invasion of Iraq. Now, to make that happen in 2009, Obama's generals insisted to him that what they'd have to do is implement a counterinsurgency strategy. What that means is that you use your troops not to chase down all the bad guys, but actually to focus on the good guys in the population. The idea is that you separate the good from the bad, and instead of going and hunting all of those guerrillas. You try to improve life for the good people of the community, reasoning that it deprives, by doing so, you deprive uh, the insurgency of the popular support it needs to sustain itself and to expand. But counterinsurgency requires resources and time. 
protecting the civilian population means doing things like ensuring law and order, providing basic services to the population like education and health care, setting up basic government operations, developing those local security forces, and rebuilding the shattered infrastructure of a country. It sounded ambitious, and it sure was. But Afghanistan was the good war, and the price tag didn't seem all that high. The president already thought he had paid for much of it with the 17,000 troops that he had signed off on in February of 2009. Now, as you all know, that, that wasn't enough for the military. Soon, the new top commander in Kabul would ask for 40,000 more troops. General Stan McChrystal sent the president an assessment shortly after he took office, or took command, I should say, where he warned that if Taliban forces fail to reverse momentum in the war, pardon me, excuse me, if, if NATO forces and US forces fail to reverse the Taliban's momentum within a year, the war would be lost. Now, McChrystal's request led to a form of sticker shock in the White House. All of a sudden, this counterinsurgency strategy that the president had so quickly signed off on soon after taking office now had a brand new price tag more than 100,000 total US troops on the ground. As a consequence, the president decided to convene his war cabinet for a series of strategy sessions in the White House Situation Room. Now, those in uniform, General McChrystal from Kabul, Admiral Mike Mullen, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and General Dave Petraeus, the hero of the Iraq War, who then was running the US Central Command, all argued that more troops were essential for the Afghan war. They all argued to the president that a troop surge was what had turned around the war in Iraq, even though the true historical record shows that the reasons for the diminution in violence there were far more complex and multifaceted. Now, in Afghanistan, that troop surge wasn't just going to be doing what they did in Iraq, essentially serving as referees in the midst of a civil war. In Afghanistan, they'd have to do something far more challenging. They'd have to try to convince the majority ethnic Pashtun tribal population to cast their lot with President Hamid Karzai's government instead of with the insurgency. The problem was that Karzai's administration was often far more rapacious and corrupt than the Taliban. How could coin work? How could counterinsurgency work when the locals were turning to, their, to the insurgents to protect them from their supposed protectors? COIN also requires patience. It can take years before a besieged population feels safe enough to demonstrate allegiance to their nation. But the generals downplayed all of those risks and costs. Now, civilians in the president's war cabinet had a very different view. They were very skeptical of the military's claims. Chief skeptic there was Vice President Biden. He doubted whether President Karzai would really be a meaningful partner in American efforts, and he questioned whether the Pakistani government would really take steps to crack down on Taliban sanctuaries on its own soil. And in these discussions, which spilled out for some weeks and weeks, Biden really became the most vociferous critic of the military's plans. In my reporting for this book, I managed to get my hands on a memo that Biden wrote directly for the president after one of their sessions in the White House Situation Room. It's never been released before, and let me read it to you. It, it's one paragraph long, and since we're just sort of two weeks away from this election, it, it gives some, I think, valuable insight into where Biden's head was on all of this back then. He wrote to the president, I do not see how anyone who took part in our discussions could emerge without profound questions about the viability of counterinsurgency. Our military will do its part. They will clear anything we ask them to clear. They'll hold anything we ask them to hold. But no one can tell you with conviction when, and even if, we can produce the flip sides of coin that are required to build and transfer responsibility to the Afghans, an effective and sustainable civilian surge, a credible partner in Kabul, basic governance and services, and competent Afghan security forces. We simply can't control these variables, yet they're essential to the success of coin. In the end, as we all know, the president decided to side with his commanders. He gave them much of what they wanted, 30,000 more troops. He did impose one significant condition, a deadline, that those troops would have to start coming home within two years. It was a deadline he took from the military's own planning documents that promised that areas in Afghanistan could be cleared of insurgents and handed over to the Afghans within just 18 to 24 months. 
Now, a month after the president made the surge announcement from West Point, New York, I was in my office in Washington, D.C., preparing for yet another trip to Washington. I was going to be accompanying a, bata a battalion of U.S. Marines as they prepared to assault a Taliban stronghold in southwestern Afghanistan called Marja. And Marja was a nasty place. There were hundreds of insurgents holed up there, dozens of bomb-making factories. The dirt roads were seeded with makeshift mines. The fields were all growing opium-producing poppy, the sales of which were being used to fund the insurgency. And so in my office, I decided, you know, I should get a look at this place before I get out there. And so I, I, I opened Google Earth, and I zoomed in with that satellite imagery on what I thought was Marja. And I traveled around Afghanistan enough to know that, you know, over there, all the, the farm plots have sort of meandering borders. Nothing, it doesn't look anything like the American Midwest with nice 90 degree angles. Everything is demarcated without the aid of modern surveying technology. And as I looked over at Marge, I noticed something very bizarre. What initially looked to me like roads, but I'd later discover were, were irrigation canals. North, south, razor sharp, like the avenues of Manhattan. I said, this is odd. I wonder you know, what these are, and I wonder who built them. I started poking around. I, I'd soon discover the, you know, the answer existed in the Library of Congress and our national archives, even at the files of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And like so many other things in our modern world, it was out there on the internet. And it was a story that was suffused with relevant lessons for our latest attempt at nation building. But it seemed that few in Washington had bothered to read about it or connect the dots. And it's a story that begins quite remarkably with the Holocaust. In the mid-1930s, Jewish fur traders fleeing Nazi advances in Europe largely came to the United States. They settled in New York. And they needed a new source for pelts to make coats and hats. So they turned, quite remarkably, to the landlocked nation of Afghanistan, halfway around the world, because their usual markets in Europe were no longer available. And Afghanistan's hills were, were filled with the Persian fat-tailed sheep. Now, the newborn fleece of those Persian fat-tailed sheep could be turned into lustrous coats and hats. And so in the late 30s and early 40s, Afghanistan exported between one and two million fur pelts a year to the United States. The sale of each of those pelts put a couple of dollars in the Afghan king's treasury because of currency exchange controls that functioned like a tax. So at the end of the Second World War, as Europe was digging out of rubble, Afghanistan was sitting on a comparative windfall. It had $100 million in gold and silver reserves in its national treasury. And so the king in Kabul, 32-year-old Mohammed Zahir Shah, who had been so impressed with what the United States had done in the Tennessee Valley during the Great Depression, thought that he could try to vault his primitive nation into the modern era with some of this money. And he focused in the southern part of his country the Helmand River, the banks of which are a barren, arid desert. And he thought perhaps he could transform this area into a verdant agricultural oasis, turn it into a breadbasket to ease the pain of frequent food shortages in his country. And so in 1946, the Afghan government hired the world's best engineering and construction firm at the time, a San Francisco-based company called Morrison Knudsen, which had just built the Hoover Dam and the San Francisco Bay Bridge and would later go on to build Cape Canaveral in Florida. This wasn't a foreign aid project. The Afghans just paid it outright. And in 1947, dozens of American engineers began tromping through the deserts of southern Afghanistan. Now, there was another part to this project. The king saw it. As, as part of a grand agricultural development scheme. But he had a handful of advisors who he had sent in the early 30s to the United States to go to college. In fact, to Illinois, to Chicago. A number of them lived in the same rooming house in this very city. And they'd returned back to Kabul. And they wanted to bring with them the America that had dazzled them in their school days. And so they thought that in addition to building these new modern farms, they'd build modern villages where people from different tribes would live next to one another rather than in separate communities. They'd resettle nomads. They'd educate girls. Women would cast off the head-to-toe burqa. Written laws would replace eye-for-an-eye Islamic justice. Professional government men 
would supplant the gray-bearded elders who were wielding power out in the provinces back then. It was going to be a grand social engineering experiment. And these Afghans, these English-speaking, suit-wearing, American-educated Afghans, saw in these teams of American engineers the ideal partners for the transformation of their nation. Now, early on, however, this agricultural project started to develop some problems. It turns out that the, the soil in the Helmand River Valley down there is, is very saline. And uh, I'm no agricultural expert, but I've been told that under the, under the topsoil is a, is a thick layer of sort of impermeable crust. Think of the Helmand River Valley as a, as a giant planter box, but without any drainage holes. And when the Afghans watered their fields, they tended to flood them. The water just pooled on the surface. And when it evaporated, it left even more salts in the soil that stunted anything that was grown there. So the Afghan government started to develop reservations about this project. Well, the American contractor's response was simply to do more, to expand, to build a big dam, to build more canals, to build a reservoir. Of course, it was going to increase the cost. But the Afghan king didn't mind. He had all this money in his treasury. And so they started to move nomads across the country, promising them that they would get these very lush, productive farms. They wound up living in tent camps, waiting for their farms to be developed, waiting for these new villages to be built. Unfortunately, the promised farmland soon turned to marshland. And the new villages, well, they weren't built very quickly. Well, the Americans, these American engineers, had also been living in tent camps. And they wanted at least someplace more comfortable to live. And they thought, look, if they can't get on with the agricultural development side of this project, at least we can get a crack on the social engineering side of this. So in 1953, smack dab in the middle of Helmand province, the Americans started to build a town for themselves, eight square blocks wide. Now, if any of you have seen pictures of Afghanistan, of homes in Afghanistan, or watched documentaries on TV, you'll know that around almost every home in Afghanistan is a tall wall made out of brick or, or mud to, pre to prevent outsiders from gazing in at your women folk. Well, in this little town, there were no walls. Suburban style, white stucco walled homes with manicured green front lawns. There was a, the country's first and only co-ed high school. There was a swimming pool where boys and girls would swim together. A clubhouse with nightly card games, weekly square dances, and a bartender who'd mix a potent gin and tonic. Well, the Americans insisted on calling the town by its sort of historical name, Lashkar Gah, which means army barracks in Persian. It's what the area had been called. The Afghans looked at this place and said, you know, it's fine for you Americans to live this way, but we don't really aspire to build this for ourselves. But they did come up with a name for it, Little America. That's where I get the title for my book. Now, the project on the agriculture side continued to be troubled, and by the late 1950s, the Afghans finally fired the American contractor. But Washington couldn't let this thing fall into disrepair. Because if it did, it worried that the Soviets, who were already active in northern Afghanistan, would swoop down, take over the work, it would be a blight on America's reputation, and give the Soviets a foothold very close to American-allied Pakistan. So in the late 50s, our government started to send teams of uh, federal engineers over there to try to fix this problem. And in, in 1961, as soon as President Kennedy f formed the U.S. Agency for International Development, Afghanistan became one of its top overseas priorities. Now, the government engineers found some key problems. One was the canal had been built too low to the ground, and because the fields weren't flat, water didn't really roll, you know, pour off very well. So the Americans came up with a plan. They said, OK, look, we're going to bring in dozens and dozens of bulldozers and earth-moving equipment. We're going to move the Afghans off their land, flatten the land, invite them back on. But nobody bothered to communicate this to the Afghans. So when the bulldozers arrived, the Afghans thought they were being permanently evicted, and they decided to meet the bulldozers with rifles. Thus began a more than 10-year-long process of US engineers trying to come up with solutions, only to be foiled because of a lack of understanding of Afghan tradition, culture, history, understanding the basic way of life, and a fundamental lack of communicating with the Afghan people. By the early 1970s, funding ran out. The Americans packed up to leave. Three months after the project ended, Henry Kissinger found himself off in Kabul. And the Afghan prime minister complained to him that this project was like an unfinished symphony. And, and the Americans had to get it right. So Kissinger sent word back to Washington 
that the United States had to try again. And this time, the job went to a tiny little federal agency called the US Soil Conservation Service. They sent a team of experts to Afghanistan. and They came up with a, a maddeningly simple solution. Simply give the Afghans hand tools and have them dig little ditches on their fields themselves. And in fact, on the first fields that these ditches were dug on, yields increased by 75%. But then what happened? Next year, there was a communist coup in Kabul, and then Soviet tanks rolled into Afghanistan. By then, every American had left little America. We'd finally come up with a sustainable solution to problems that had bedeviled us for decades. But it was too late. Now, had any senior officials in the White House, the Pentagon, State Department, bothered to understand any of this history of Americans in Afghanistan back in 2009, I'd like to think it might have given them pause before advocating another grand scheme of nation building in that country. Instead, we simply barreled forward with a strategy that had little chance of working. In my book, I dissect the, the current American effort to stabilize Afghanistan on two levels. The first is strategic. That is, was the, the coin strategy, was the troop surge the right decision? The second is, is operationally, and that is, once the president did sign off on that surge and approve the counterinsurgency strategy, how well did the organs of his government, the Pentagon, the State Department, the US Agency for International Development, even his own White House, how well did they actually implement that policy? Let's start with strategy. And let me state up front, I think that counterinsurgency can work if the conditions are right and the cost is merited. But for coin to prevailed in Afghanistan, several things needed to occur. The Afghan government had to be a willing partner. The Pakistanis had to crack down on Taliban sanctuaries. The US government had to be willing to spend money and commit troops for years and years on end. The American people had to be patient enough for security to improve slowly. And the Afghan army had to be ready and willing to assume control of areas that had been cleared of insurgents by US forces. <coughs> First. Let's talk about the Afghan government. President Hamid Karzai never agreed with our war strategy. Now look, a principal problem in Afghanistan is that Karzai's government is so corrupt, so rapacious, that it literally turns people into, in, into supporters of the insurgency just because they hate their government so much. It's, it's filled with warlords, corrupt thugs, people who shake down the population for bribes, who kidnap boys for pleasure. It, it, it's filled with a, a lot of loathsome, despicable figures. But the, and, and the US, US officials saw this problem. And so in 2009, they said, okay, look, the solution here has to be a comprehensive counterinsurgency program, not just going and killing bad guys or providing security in areas, but we need to essentially rebuild the Afghan government or, in some cases, build from scratch institutions of local government, reasoning that if they could provide things like education and health care and get the Afghans to do so at the local level, people would turn to supporting the government instead of the Taliban. And the Afghans have no great love for the Taliban. They know what religious zealots they are. They lived under these guys in the 1990s. You know, the fact that they're acquiescing to the Taliban in places is simply a statement of how bad the Afghan government is. But to President Karzai, all this stuff down there at the local level to rebuild schools and health clinics and to try to put professional people in charge of local government upended the patronage networks that he'd built up, upended his alliances with warlords and power brokers. So he sought to oppose it at every twist and turn. What about Pakistan? You know, after the 2001 attacks, when the US forces and Northern Alliance troops pushed into Kabul and beyond, Al Qaeda leadership and senior Talib leaders fled into Pakistan. At that time, they were given a degree of sanctuary by the Pakistani military and its intelligence service. But then, in those early years of the war, Pakistani security services refrained from providing outright support. The Talibs were allowed to meet, reorganize, raise money themselves, even procure weapons, which isn't all that hard to do in Pakistan. But, but th there was a line between what the Pakistani government would do and what the Taliban wanted. But by mid-2009, as American surge forces started coming in the country, all gloves came off. 
Pakistan's intelligence service started providing money, intelligence, and munitions via civilian intermediaries to the Taliban. Now, let's talk about the domestic front for a second. Cost. You know that it costs $1 million to keep one service member in Afghanistan for a single year? That means the annual tab for our war last year was $100 billion. Is achieving a marginally less bad outcome in Afghanistan worth that expense? With other pressing security challenges, Iran, North Korea, upheaval in the Middle East, is it prudent to be tying up so many forces and dispersing so many precious dollars in remote Afghan villages? What of American patience? The surge has exhausted it. You know, the war was in its eighth year when Obama decided to surge. Even though many Americans shared the president's view that Afghanistan was the good war, only a slim majority supported the decision to send more troops. Now, commanders in chief shouldn't use polls to guide strategic decisions, but public support is essential for any drawn out campaign involving thousands, tens of thousands of troops, hundreds of monthly casualties, and almost daily fatalities. You know, had all those other factors played out differently, had Karzai been a true partner, had the Pakistanis cracked down on uh, uh, sanctuaries, had we all not been in the throes of economic stagnation, then perhaps the public could have rallied around such a large war effort. But when all those indicators started pointing down, public opinion soon followed. Now even a, a majority of Republicans believe the Afghan war is no longer worth fighting. What are the Afghan army? You know, instead of compelling Afghan soldiers into action, the surge sent the opposite message. The Afghans often decided to simply hang back, let the Americans do the fighting. What was supposed to be a good kick in the pants, or at least a golden opportunity to work in tandem with the Americans, turned into a crutch. But lest you think I'm all about the negative, the Afghan army has emerged as a rare bright spot in this overall effort. As American troops are starting to come home, the Afghans are stepping up to shoulder more of the fighting. And through it all, the army remains the country's most respected institution. If the place is to hold together after conventional US troops depart at the end of 2014, it's gonna be because of the Afghan army. Now, what should we have done back in 2009? I'm, look, I'm not one of those who think that we should have just packed up and left en masse. I mean, had we done that, or even if we tried to do that tomorrow, it likely would condemn the Afghans to the hell of a prolonged insurgency and another bloody, bloody civil war. I still think we have a moral obligation to the Afghan people. When we launched the war in 2001, we made an implicit promise to them that if they stood with us against the Taliban, we'd try to give them a shot at a better, freer life. But that didn't require counterinsurgency or a vast surge. You know, one of the principal characters in my book is a brave young State Department officer named Cale Weston. He spent seven years deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he's argued to me that instead of going big with surging or going home, we Americans should have gone long. The president needed to determine how many troops we were willing to commit to Afghanistan for 10 years or so. It likely would have meant no surge. It probably would have meant reducing the troops that were already there. But he reasoned that a smaller, enduring force would be smarter on all fronts. It would compel the Afghans to take more responsibility for fighting. It would, it would get uh, the Americans to focus on only the most essential projects instead of grand schemes at nation building. And for ordinary Afghan people, it would appeal to them because they chafe at the idea of so many foreign troops on their soil. Afghanistan, he said, is a marathon, not a sprint. The surge was a sprint, and we Americans got winded way too quickly. Now, despite all of those coin assumptions that turned out to be false, our troops have made remarkable progress there over the past three years. Parts of southern Afghanistan that were once teeming with insurgents are now uh, uh, largely peaceful. Schools have reopened, has of bazaars. People are living as close to a normal life there as possible. But Afghanistan as a whole, as we know, is not fully secure. Eastern parts of the country are still in the grip of a Taliban faction backed by Pakistan's intelligence service. And in the south, where we've seen a lot of these gains over the past couple of years, there's a critical question that still lingers. Will the Afghans, will their government, their army, their police force, have the willingness and ability to take the baton from American troops as they start coming home? Will the Afghans sustain those gains? Will all of the blood and treasure we have expended there have been worth it? Or will it slip back into chaos 
Now, that doesn't mean that Talibs are going to be able to roll back into Kabul with the same ease as they did in the 1990s. I don't think the Kabul government's going to fall like Saigon's did. The Afghan army should be able to protect major cities and other critical areas. But the insurgents will almost certainly expand control of rural districts and retain the ability to conduct frequent attacks. The foreseeable future is going to be messy and chaotic. But many fellow Americans may well see it as good enough. Osama's dead. Al-Qaeda's on the ropes. The Talib leadership's taken a beating. But could have all of that have occurred without a surge? Could we have achieved a similar messy but good enough outcome without hundreds more dead and thousands more gravely wounded? Before I take your questions, I want to turn to the issue of how the surge was executed. I've talked about the strategic disconnect. Now I want to talk about the operational failure. Agree or disagree with the surge, it was the president's strategy. And the government beneath him had an obligation to make a good faith effort to implement it. Let's talk about the military for a second. We simply sent too many troops to the wrong places. Back in 2009, the real the most critical part of Afghanistan was the southern city of Kandahar. It's the second largest city in the country. It's sort of the spiritual capital for the ethnic Pashtun population. It's the place the Talibs were fighting hardest to try to reclaim. Because if they did, they'd have a springboard to seize much of the rest of the country, just as they did in the 1990s. But instead, so you would think that we would have sent the bulk of our forces there. Instead, we sent them off to neighboring Helmand province, where those engineers were decades earlier, but a part of the country that was home to about 1% of the population. Why did we do that? Tribal rivalries, not in Afghanistan, but in the Pentagon. That first wave of forces was comprised of US Marines, and they wanted to deploy with their own helicopters, their own logistics units, and top commanders reasoned it would be too difficult to plug them in to the areas around Kandahar, where there were already American and Canadian Army units operating. So we gave them a patch of desert way off uh, in a place that was far less strategically relevant than the areas around Kandahar. Squandered a year of the surge. Uh, talk about reconstruction. You know, Afghanistan is eminently deserving of, of, of our assistance and that of our allies. I mean, their rates of, of malnutrition, infant mortality, illiteracy, they're off the charts. It's one of the poorest countries on the planet. And it was starved of resources under the Bush administration. Well, Team Obama came in with the right instincts. They wanted to help the Afghan people. They wanted to provide more resources. But we, we unfortunately got to a situation where we were trying to do too much of a good thing. In 2010, we tried to spend $4.1 billion on reconstruction programs in that country, far more than the country could reasonably absorb. You know, in just in one little district of Helmand province, a district is like a county over there. What we tried to spend through just one USAID program equated to more than the per capita income for every man, woman, and child of that entire area. Not surprisingly, we wind up exacerbating the very corruption we were trying to stem. Um, now, you like to think that at least when our troops are fighting off in Afghanistan, our senior officials back in Washington are all sort of rowing in the same direction to, to, to help support them. Unfortunately, what I found was a whole nother war that was taking place while we were fighting in Afghanistan. And that was in Washington. Uh, and one of the nastiest fights was actually between the White House and the State Department. All members of the same team, all members of President Obama's cabinet. And it, it pains me to, to talk about this, but um, Secretary of State Clinton brought in the late veteran diplomat Richard Holbrook to be her point man on Afghanistan, to be the person who would try to chart a path toward potential peace talks with the Taliban if we could use those surge forces to leverage uh, negotiations eventually. Now, he was a guy who was eminently qualified to do this. I mean, at age 27, he'd been the youngest American to serve on the US delegation to the Paris peace talks aimed at ending the Vietnam War. In 1996, he almost single-handedly brokered the Dayton Accords that ended the fighting in the Balkans. Now, Holbrook uh, was a guy who did come in with a, with a big ego big personality, sharp elbows, a, th a thirst for the spotlight. He was, he was a dramatic person in a White House run by a president nicknamed No Drama Obama. And as a consequence, some of the president's top aides thought that Holbrook was just too disruptive, was, was too much of a showboat. And so as a result, they set about trying to marginalize him. They, they scheduled key meetings when he was out of town. They prevented him from using US government aircraft to travel to the region. They undercut him 
in front of the leaders of Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'm not trying to argue that Holbrook was right or the White House was right or either was wrong. The Pro problem here was that you had two warring camps and that conflict should have been addressed. The failure to address that meant that we made no progress on the whole issue of potential negotiations with the Taliban for the first 18 months of the troop surge. We squandered that time, the moment when we had the most leverage on the battlefield because we were sending in troops, not pulling them out. In closing, you know, I just want to note that you know, yes, more Americans did perish on the beaches of Normandy and in the jungles of Vietnam, but Afghanistan, at least to me, stands alone in the annals of American warfare. You know, it's our country's longest war. It's longer than even the Revolutionary War. It's a forgotten war with no draft. The fighting's been left to a small cadre of professional officers and volunteer grunts. And it's by far the most complicated war our nation's tried to prosecute. Our troops have been told to befriend villagers and bombard insurgents with the same fervor, often in the same day. Commanders have been ordered to fight with fewer forces and in less time than they've wanted. Diplomats and development experts have been asked to work in environments that were far more dangerous than they'd ever signed up for. All told, I spent three years observing the United States attempting to defeat the insurgency in Afghanistan. For a long time, I believed that we could pull it off if only we had enough people, money, and patience. But I'd soon conclude that the real challenge wasn't headcounts, budgets, or public opinion. For all the grand pronouncements about waging a new kind of war, our nation was simply unable to adapt. Too few generals recognized that surging forces could be counterproductive, that the presence of more foreign troops in the Pashtun heartland would be a potent recruiting tool for the Taliban. Too few soldiers were ordered to leave their air-conditioned bases and live among the locals in fly-infested villages. Too few diplomats invested the effort to understand the languages and cultures of the places in which they were stationed. Too few officials in Washington were willing to assume the risks necessary to forge a lasting peace. And nobody, it seemed, wanted to work together. The good war had turned bad. For years, we Americans dwelled on the limitations of the Afghans. Instead, we should have focused on our own. Thank you. Thank you. And now I think we have time for some questions. So uh, there, there are two microphones up there. Please uh, feel free to come up there. And if you could just frame it in terms of a question. Yes, please. Summarize for us the specific things you think we ought to be doing in order to fulfill what you declared is our moral responsibility <coughs> in Afghanistan. It's a very good question. Yes, and the, the, the good news on this is I think we are headed in that direction. The president is bringing troops home. It remains to be seen if the next occupant of the White House will continue on that trajectory or not, but I think continuing to reduce our troop presence there is essential. We're focusing the use of those troops on trying to train and mentor Afghan security forces. Now, I understand the Afghan forces are, are very raggedy, in, in some cases, they're filled uh, with people with questionable loyalties, but it, it is the best chance that the Afghan people have to prevent that country from slipping into, back into a, an all-out civil war. I'm not trying to say that, that it's a certainty that we'll, we'll prevent a civil war, but certainly the security force is the best chance they have. Now, we've made a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of mistakes in, in what we've done therein. I, I had a long piece on the front page of today's Washington Post where I write that we, we tried to, we're trying to build too large of a force. Uh, if we fo focused on a smaller, more capable force, we'd probably be in a better position. But to the substance of your point, we're now moving away from conducting our own combat operations to simply trying to build up those forces as a path to getting out. On the civilian assistance side, we are reducing some of those reconstruction budgets. We're closing things like provincial reconstruction teams, which essentially functioned as shadow governments that, that served in some cases as a crutch from keeping the Afghans from, from taking responsibility for themselves. So, you know, like in some ways, the twilight years of the Little America project, it feels to me like we're, we're starting to move toward a more sensible, sustainable footing. And I know for many Americans, it, it feels like this is way too long of a war, way too costly of a war. But our presence there is evolving. 
if only we had taken that approach some years ago. Well, that to me is the great tragedy of all of this. Yeah. I'm Carla Scherer, and I'm a vice chair of the Chicago Humanities Festival. I take a, <clears throat> excuse me, a very deep personal interest in what you've had to say since my family has close ties to that part of the world. My son-in-law is a chaplain with the United States Army based right there. I got a call from my daughter this morning. 17 missiles had hit Bagram Air Force Base, which he had been sent to to minister. One missile landed five feet from where he was laying and taking cover. It did not mercifully explode. However, he had to deal with the chaos. No chaplain from any other uh, of our forces was there. We are leaving these people out to dry with not, without the basic backup that they need. My question to you, inelegantly phrased, is should we either pee or get off the pot, or should we send enough forces to back up our men and women who are, are doing the work that has to be done? Well, it's, it's a very good question, and, and thank you for your, your son-in-law's service. Um, I think, let me, let me try to step back a couple of years and, 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 and address your question in the frame of that. I think there were really two defensible positions the U.S. could have taken. One was a real full-on surge, not a surge of 40,000 troops, probably 100,000 troops. So lots and lots of troops flooding the zone, and a comprehensive effort to really rebuild Afghanistan's government from getting the Afghans around the table to rewrite a constitution. They, they've got a totally screwed up constitution. I mean, a constitution on a paper that centralizes more power in, in the capital than any other country on the face of the earth, save for North Korea. I mean, it just, you have a country that is, that is so diverse, so, um, uh, you know, great streaks of sort of at least independence among people, um, people who, who want to be sort of left alone in their remote valleys, and yet the constitution that they have is completely not in keeping with, with the way the, the people relate to their government. We would have had to have pushed for a new president in that country. We would have had to really do sort of soup to nuts, top down. It would have been costly, taken a lot of people, more casualties. And it's debatable whether the Afghans would have gone along for all of this. But in my mind, logically speaking, if we Americans determine that the cost of doing that, of fixing Afghanistan, was worth the, you know, the trillion dollars and all that other stuff, the years it would take, you do that, or you focus on a much narrower mission, a narrow counterterrorism mission going after and killing top-level terrorist leaders and, and operatives that pose a genuine threat to the American homeland and American interests. Far, far fewer forces, largely sort of special operators going in, and drones, and just a narrow fight aimed at going after those who are threatening American interests, but no nation building. We kind of came right out of the middle. And so, you know, we wanted to do this big counterinsurgency stuff, but we didn't have the, the resources to do it, but we had way too many forces that we would have needed for just that narrow mission. And so there was a big strategic disconnect. Uh, and to some degree, I think we're still in it, um, but I see us heading in the right direction. I mean, giant bases like Bagram need to be reduced in scope and size, and there's still a lot of stuff there that, that we're doing for our own purposes as opposed to simply focus on, let's build up those Afghan forces and let's retain an ability there to engage in any sort of missions uh, to go after people who pose a, a direct and genuine threat to the United States. Um, but. But, but, but your question is, is one, is a sentiment uh, that, that is reflected by a number of service member I, members I talk to, where they feel like they're being asked to do a mission that they don't have the, the, the capacity to do, um, and, 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 they're, and they're, they, what, they, the, what they have the capacity to do is, is not yet been reoriented with what um, needs to happen. And that's sort of a, a pardon me, an inelegant way of, of, of saying there's still a disconnect. And, and unfortunately, you know, your, your son-in-law um, witnesses that, experiences that, lives with that on a, on a daily basis. Very thankful about that rocket. Yes. 
Um, you expressed a lot of confidence or the need for confidence in the security forces, the Afghan security forces, yet very troubling reports come about the treacherous turnings of the security forces on their American counterparts. And so how can the Americans who are training these Afghans really have confidence when they know of so many treacherous uh, killings of their fellows uh, in the field. So I'm just saying there's the dichotomy between trust but verify. You put your finger on what is perhaps the, the single largest threat risk to the current strategy. Um, and and this, 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 this keeps senior American commanders up very late at night because there's no good answer for it. Now, it's all these attacks that are occurring. They call them green on blue attacks. They're not all Taliban infiltration. Many of them are. Many of them are the Talibs sneaking into the security forces to conduct these attacks. In other cases, it's, it's simply legitimate members of the Afghan security forces who've been fighting on the front lines, in some cases, for four or five years. They are they're stressed out beyond belief. They don't have the same amenities that U.S. forces do. They don't often get, get back to see their families. And so little things sometimes can escalate into gunfights and inadvertent cultural slights can, can turn into um, uh, uh, incidents with very tragic outcomes. Um, that said, uh, US, for, U.S. commanders are taking steps to try to increase uh, security for those U.S. troops that are working alongside the Afghans. But there's only so much you can do. It gets to a point where if you totally fortify yourselves, you're creating distance from those very troops that you're trying to mentor and partner to, to make them capable enough to stand on their own. And so there is going to be a degree of risk in this going forward. And, and it, it makes, there's a, there's a degree of helplessness here. To me, it reminds me of, of being in Baghdad in early 2004, as roadside bombs first started to become really prevalent, and left wondering, how could our, our, our military, the most powerful military on Earth, find its vehicles and its, the occupants of those vehicles getting so, so badly destroyed by, by crude little bombs placed on the side of the road? And yes, steps were taken, but even today, our troops in Afghanistan are not fully immune from these sorts of, 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 of um, weapons. And so I, I do fear that we, we are entering a phase where these will continue to be there. We will continue to, to, to have brave men and women who will be um, victims of some of these attacks. But, um, and then there has to be a, a genuine discussion about how much, uh, how much risk do you take for that, for that end. And certainly as, as you see the, the fragility of the Afghan forces, you say, well, why do we keep sort of keep on keeping on doing this? At the same time, is that, is that the, the least worst outcome, so to speak? Thanks. Yep. Hi. Um, a couple of questions. Number one, do you think with the death of bin Laden and sort of al-Qaeda on the run, uh, the president really is no longer, the, uh, has Afghanistan as important to him anymore, uh, <laughs> just from a very political sense, because, you know, until that time, the tone was very different, but after bin Laden is dead and most of the al-Qaeda is gone, but that was sort of our main purpose in going into Afghanistan. And the second question is, uh, if we could not build Afghanistan, I mean, this goes back to the history of Afghanistan, and I fortunately went to school with many Afghani Sikhs in India. Uh, it, it's a country that has a very ancient history. Uh, we've tried, when in peacetime, people could not build it. Why do we think we can go there and build anything? Why don't we just pack up and leave, and leave the Afghans to themselves? They've lived from the time of Alexander to now within themselves, and they should be left to live the life they want to live. And it is really incumbent on us to understand this part of the history also, and not interfere with their lives. I'm very sure after we leave, in a year or two, they will find balance. They've lived there for a long time. They've never invaded any other country. They've never left their homelands. They've never been terrorists before. And Afghans are some of the nicest people I have known in my life. And I should say we should leave them alone. Well, look, this is, this is the direction we have to be heading in. And I, I, I think that once you, when there are few, for instance, when there are fewer coalition forces there, when, when the coalition forces leave, that's when you're really gonna get the best chance of getting some sort of negotiated settlement to this. It's not going to be because we're there. It's going to be because the Afghans 
figure out, all right, look, we've, we've solved problems like this ourselves. We're going to, you know, the Taliban will assess the relative strength of the Afghan army. The Afghan government will assess the, the strength of the insurgency. And they'll, they'll, they will start to resolve this in a more traditional way. Um, now, look, it, 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 it's a nice thought to say, oh, if only we left there all tomorrow. Bottom line is, even if, even if the president decided we're leaving there tomorrow, it would take months and months to get all those troops out, to get all that equipment out. We're pretty much leaving as, as well, not as quickly as we can, but we're leaving with, with on, on a pretty steep trajectory. Now, that could be accelerated next year, and I think, you know, obviously, the results of, of the election next month will determine the, the scope of that. Um, Romney's been very vague, but um, I, I, I think that, well, neither, quite frankly, the, the honest truth is neither candidate talks much about Afghanistan, and uh, I don't have a horse in this race. I don't vote, but I, I'll just say that I think that we all um, uh, are, are a little lacking in the overall public uh, debate over all of this, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, both candidates have their reasons for not wanting to talk about this war uh, more, but we're, we're we got 68,000 troops that are still there, thousands of civilians. Um, I think they and, and the rest of us at least are owed a meaningful discussion. I hope tomorrow night uh, at the foreign policy debate we do get one and start to get a clearer sense of where each candidate uh, would go uh, next year on, on, on issues of, of, of troop levels and such. Yep. Um, it's, it seems to me that you know we always define victory in a in a war like this as the as the country becoming democratic, sort of, you know, loosely after our, our ideals and values. Um, and, and you had made the comment that we sort of disregard Karzai because he's corrupt. Well, we've got corruption in India, which is very well publicly known. China, which is an extremely corrupt country. Indonesia, which has got corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got corruption in those parts of the world. It's much greater. What would the outcome might have been had we said, "Okay, Karzai, you're corrupt," but and by the way, you were put there by us to begin with, but you are an Afghan. What's your solution? Maybe, let, if it, even if it's a corrupt solution, it may have uh, resulted in fewer deaths and greater national security for us if we had. I mean, you talked about rightfully so. We never listened to the people that we're trying to save. Did we give him enough chance, even with his corruption, to maybe come to, uh, come to a better solution than what we have now? We screwed it up early on with Karzai. You know, back in 2002 and 2003, he wanted to take on the warlords. He wanted to disband the militias. He wanted to be that sort of inclusive national leader that the international community was, was hoping for. And, and early on, we thought he might be. Um, but the US failed to support him, the previous administration. Don Rumsfeld refused to give and commit enough troops to Afghanistan to allow Karzai to take on some of these warlords. Um, and then we pulled troops out to go to Iraq. Had we actually, from the earliest days, focused on helping Karzai do what he wanted to do, we wouldn't be in this mess today. And Karzai wouldn't be the sort of leader that, that gives everybody sort of palpitations in Washington. Now, yes, some of where Karzai is today is a result of his own sort of inherent nature, his, his, his tribal way of doing business as opposed to being a, a genuine sort of um, uh, uniter of his people. But, but a lot of what drives us and drives the international community and drives many Afghans mad about Karzai is, is, is a result of, of mistakes that, that we had made. Just back to comparison with other countries, just say real briefly, um, yeah, huge corruption in India, Indonesia, elsewhere. But you don't see that corruption actively fueling popular support for a insurgency that threatens the very state. And in Afghanistan, it is the, the, the truly rapacious behavior of its government, um, in part because of what Karzai sees are sort of rational acts he needs to make for his own self-preservation, but it, has, it, is, it is creating something of a monster. And that's why um, at least being cognizant and either addressing it or saying, we don't want any part of this, but you have, you have to sort of pick an approach. Um, we talked a good game about corruption. We, we, we did very, very little. Um, uh, but you know, ultimately, you have to say, all right, is this is this something you want to go after or not? 
either way, you know, even if going after corruption, the 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 U.S. Um, political goal has has never been the sort of hey, let's try to build a Jeffersonian democracy there. Um, and you know, look, if if we can, uh, the the presidential election they had back in two thousand nine was deeply flawed. If we if if they can have a reasonably good election in two thousand fourteen, that's great. But I don't think that you know anybody's sort of looking and saying the the advancement of great democratic institutions is the you know is a reason that we need to continue to sort of keep on keeping on over there. And when I say anybody, I, let me qualify that by saying sort of anybody currently in senior positions of government back in, in Washington. <laughs> I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about Pakistan's role in all this. Um, we hear so much about the Taliban being <laughs> Um, sheltered in Pakistan and also the country itself seems like such a mess that its future role in Afghanistan seems very dangerous. It's a good question. Look, Pakistan fundamentally does not want to stable Afghanistan. Uh, just that that's the bottom line here. And it's, it's a very simple calculus. Um, yeah, pardon me. Pakistan does not want a stable Afghanistan. And that is it is as simple as that, and, and here's why. Um, if Afghanistan were left on its own, free from outside interference, Afghanistan would naturally have a closer relationship to India than Pakistan. The northern Afghans who fought against the Taliban received a lot of support from the Indians in the 1990s and, and before that, and they have closer relations to New Delhi than to, to, to Pakistan. Even for many Pashtuns in the south and the east, they see India as the land of economic and educational opportunity. It's where Hamid Karzai went to school. It's where a lot of other Pashtuns send their kids to go to school. India is the great big market for them to sell things to. Pakistan is the country that has um, kept them you know, strangled. M most of the commerce that comes into Afghanistan comes in via um, Pakistan. The Afghans resent the fact that Pakistani traders jack up prices and, and whatnot. Um, so, the, 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 the security established, oh, I should, one little interesting uh, point of fact here. September 1947, the new nation of Pakistan applies for na uh, membership to the United Nations. The vote is put to the General Assembly. One nation votes no. It's not India, it's Afghanistan. Because their, their tensions have also gone back for decades. It has to do with the, the, the British drawing of the Durand line between the two countries. Where does the ethnic Pashtun population most, you know, uh, should, it, should it be part of Afghanistan or not, a view that was held by the late king, for instance. All that said, the, to Pakistan's national security establishment, to their military, to their spy services, they recognize this fact about Afghanistan being closer to India if left alone. And they cannot allow on their rear flank in Afghanistan, their arch rival India to plant a flag. So they will continue to stir the pot by funding and arming and equipping their proxies, the Taliban, to stir trouble in Afghanistan and to increase their leverage to do their bidding in Afghanistan, just as a way to, to uh, keep India out, uh, or at least to limit India's influence in Afghanistan. It, it, it sort of gets right back to the unfortunate zero-sum nature of, of politics in that part of the world. And we thank you all for coming on such a lovely day.